Yeah. We're live. We're just we're you guys are gonna wing Hi, it tonight. Everyone. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we're winging it. Technical difficulties are always fun. Oh, let's see there here. Go, that's better. Yes. Okay, I can hear you guys just fine now. So. Okay. I'm going good. to my. I got you too. So. All right, we're working. We're live. I'm no SIM card. That was not a good thing. It was weird. Dun, 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 dun. We got photos. Come on, phone. There we go. Turn down the volume on that phone. We got five people in here ready. Emma. Oh, generated. Oh. All right. Hot Wheel, Reagan, what's up, guys? How you doing? Kent, what are you doing over there? Trying to get things situated. It's a little but dark if you can turn it. back on your, your big old light. It's a little dark. <laughs> Miss Greta, how are you makeup. doing tonight? <laughs> I know, right? How's that? Uh, better. Reagan, what's going on? Oh, it's going to hurt. But yeah, I can hear you. I can see you. We got nine people with us, so we're, okay. we're getting there. All right. Well, let's just build it up real quick <laughs> after we get through our technical challenges. Um, good evening, everyone. We've got Mr. Brent. That Adam guy, all the way from uh, Boone or Albion. Technically Albion now, apparently. Boone doesn't exist anymore. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is that Let's south or north of people? Sure. Okay, never mind. It's <laughs> north of St. Ed. Okay, so you're, you're south of... Yeah, Petersburg is north of Albion, I think. Anyways. Okay. <laughs> All right, folks, we got a great show tonight. Like I said, we've got Adam. Adam is a major red line collector. He is also known for his three cars that he mainly collects, the Auburn 852, the Classic Cord, and the 31 Duesenberg. So what he's got for us tonight is a unique look on the back end of things, how a car goes from a concept to what we see in the final in the package. So we're going to talk about that tonight, plus all your guys' questions and comments, and we'll do a little bit about Lincoln as well. And uh, you're going to see some stuff that you're never going to see before or again unless you go to somebody's house, and I'm not telling you where that's at. <laughs> all right, so let's get through the obvious stuff. Brent, you got anything? Um, no, not yet. I got a, I got a, I do have a box that I'm going to be opening later tonight that just came in. Oh, nice. It does, it doesn't work with the theme for the night, but it's brand new to me. So that's, and then I've got my opener, gotcha. which is, is going to hurt just, a, just a little bit for me, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I'm, I'm going to delicately open it. Though. Okay. Nice. All right. So with that, we've got um, Lincoln this weekend. You know, I I think that's going to be a great time. We're going to have uh, probably, what, 50, 60 tables there? Probably. Maybe more. Who knows? And I don't know. Yeah, I know we've put 100%. it up in the, We put it up in the Lincoln area. And there seems to be some traction gaining there. I know PJ's put the word out on the, all the local group pages. So I think we're going to have a good time. The weather's supposed to be in the double digits. So that there's a win. 33 degrees in Lincoln. Yeah. I looked, I looked that or up shorts. earlier today. Yeah. I don't know about shorts, but I'll definitely be – Having jeans on probably it's a little chilly for for me. I'm not. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so it'll also be the last day to order club cars. Um, we need to get those off to Mister uh, to Mister Dave there. So we need to make that magic happen. And 
that's pretty much all I got. Doors open at 10, two bucks to get in, goes until three. There could be a Klein sighting. Uh, we've heard rumors that he might be showing up. No Murphy's tonight. She's recovering. She, But she's doing well. So let's get into this. All right. All right, guys. You are going to get blown away. All right, Adam, what can you tell us about yourself? Can you give us a little bit um, history? How'd you get started? I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. My neighbor had an Auburn 852 Phaeton. For some reason, that kind of sticks with a guy. So ever since I was a little kid, I always thought they were cool. It happened to, you know, be in my favor that I could go next door and talk to the guy and look at his car all the time. So that's kind of always been what I've been into. And I started doing the Hot Wheels because, you know, in my mind, I'll never be able to afford a real one because I don't know if you know about the real Auburn Scores and Dues and Birds, but they are very pricey. And come to find out as I grow older, now my collection would probably pay for one. But <laughs> the goal is now to try to keep everything I got and actually get a real one here in the next maybe five, ten years. So we'll see how that goes. I think Leno has a few. Yes, he has a Duesenberg room. I would be happy with a cord, but he has a whole room of Duesenbergs plus everything else. Yeah, well, he, he bought a Plymouth from here. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I, oh, yeah, the black one, wasn't it? Yeah, he bought Carson's. They bought He bought Carson's uh, 41 Plymouth. Okay. Yeah, that was here up until about, like, two months ago. So, anywho, that's kind of me, and I've just always been into the Hot Wheels, and just kind of, to me, it seems like a natural progression of what I have now, but that's my perspective of it. <laughs> okay, so you're, you say your collection, what is it? How did you build it? What are the, the pieces that you look for when you were building your collection? So originally, I really focused on the Classic Cord and Auburn 852 because they were kind of the icons of the brand for the Auburn Cord Duesenberg Company. So my original goal was to hopefully have a rainbow of Classic Cords in every production Auburn and maybe a couple prototypes of it. And so what... So when you say rainbow, what does that mean? Okay, so the Redline cars in the Spectre Flame era, era from 1968 to 1972, they came out. Each car came in a variety of colors, and some are obviously more valuable and rare than others. Some are common. So in the Redline world, when you start getting the entire group of cars, it's called a rainbow. So the cord came in, I don't know, we'll say 12 or 15 different colors, and they range from fairly common to insanely rare on that one so that was my goal originally was just to have hopefully a rainbow of cords and it kind of escalated from there okay so you know you've you've talked about the cord and the 852 let's let's just kind of focus the conversation a little bit on the 852 okay do you have when, when mattel comes up with the idea or the designers come up with the idea for doing the 852 What's the first step that they come to? Is is it a drawing? Is it a um, go out and make a model? How, how do you come up? How do they get to that point? So originally, they obviously start with a concept, and the concept is generally on paper because obviously that's very quick and easy to do. So I, hopefully, I can you can see this. We'll see if that blocks the camera or not. But this is a Larry Wood sketch of the oh, Auburn wow. 852 as it was originally designed. And if you, I'm not sure if you can see it, it was sent to industrial design affiliates down there on the bottom corner. And they are the, actually the tool makers for Mattel. And wow. okay. so from there, <laughs> they start laying out how they think the car will go together and what it's gonna look like and everything else. So interesting to know on this one is that originally the Auburn 852 was intended to have a top. And it was going to be part of the interior and fold over as one full plastic piece. But if you can tell, they nixed it by redlining it. Larry Wood did and crossed it out. And as you know, the Auburn 852 just never was made with a top. So this is kind of one of the original, the first steps of how the design process starts is with a sketch. And then that gets sent off to the manufacturing facilities that help make it. I didn't mess up and fingerprint his glass i did no. good it's okay so then once just, they once uh, they get general concept laid out then they'll get into an approval piece which approval pieces are almost always handmade 
and often they are quite a bit different than what comes out in production. So if we get into the Auburn 852, this is actually an approval piece that came from Larry Wood Collection. Let's see if we can show this on here. And if you look, this is bloated. It is fat looking. It is long. It has bigger wheels. Everything wow. is hand painted on. It's all handmade. I would just back up a little. There you go. So the blank well, here, base, here obviously, because there's no need for tech yet. Wow. So there's just this one has an insane amount of differences from production. And I guess if you hold it up, let me grab a production piece here. This is, I mean, not for scale. Hopefully you can see the size difference between the two and how oh, much yeah, different the they are. Yeah, the fenders are way smaller. Oh, yeah, and they're much more streamlined on the production one. So it's just a really odd, to me, an odd step in the production process. And this is actually one of my favorite ones that I got from Larry Wood Collection. Was, if I was only able to get one car from that collection of the Auburns, that's the one that I wanted. And thankfully, it was the first one I got. So Very how nice. did you come into say this car in particular what was it something that found you or did you find it so as i'm assuming most of you guys know the larry wood collection when it sold it originally went to pittsburgh the nationals there was the first convention or nationals that they were selling it at and a friend of mine he had actually been on the collection so he had all the photographs that larry wood had sent for everyone to bid on the collection as a whole. And I went through the, all the pictures. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures and picked out all the Auburns that I could find and just had them, the picture set aside of what I would, you know, I guess just a bucket list. And he was going to the convention and I was not able to. So I, he knew what I was looking for anyways. So when he went to their room and he saw it, he sends me a message and I'm at work, you know, do you want to pay X dollars for this car? And I'm like, sold. <laughs> I will take it. There was, you know, no question, know exactly what it is. So that's actually what started me down uh, for the Larry Wood cars. And this was what, 2018? 17. 17? Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a very 17. famous year. Yeah. It was an expensive uh, year. Gas got burned. <laughs> oh. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Somebody got upset because it was $300. So it got burned. Oh, man. It was epic. <laughs> But anyway, anyway. We, sorry. <laughs> we, we digress. As um, always. <laughs> so as you went and procured most of the Larry Wood ones, I'm sure you didn't get all of them right away. How did you move from the Larry Wood ones to some of these other ones? So actually, you don't always get to buy them in order of production, <laughs> right? You kind of take them as you get them. And actually, my first Auburn prototype came from Mike Strauss. And this was way back in the day when he had his phone number in the back of the Tomart's price guide. And I actually called him one night and I heard that he had a prototype and called him and told him I would be looking for, to buy one if he had one to sell. And, you know, I was in college at the time. I didn't know anything. And, you know, I ended up basically buying it sight unseen over the phone from a guy that in the world is famous, but I'd never actually talked to him before. Right. So that was actually my first one. And it's a little bit later in the process, but I guess since it was my first one, We'll see if we can, this one is actually, it looks very much like the regular one, but the fenders are more of a caramel color. They're definitely different when you see them. There's two variations where it's a darker and a lighter brown, but this is even lighter still than them. And this, this may not be the exact one because I've actually got two of these. One of them came from Strauss and the other one came from Larry Wood Collection. So it's kind of hard to tell them apart when they're just sitting there. <laughs> But this is the final paint color that ended up on the production car, correct. correct? Correct. So this is basically production. They've already made a couple years of the Auburn at this point. But since we're talking, they don't, you don't always get to buy them in the order of what they were produced. Right. You just kind of take what you can. So What amazes me is that how these cars have survived. You know, I don't see how Mattel, they don't document things like the way no. they do now you know well and everybody knows now right Back right then they weren't collectible so a lot of them got thrown away in dumpsters and mattel and everything else right and that's what kills me is like how much of this stuff ended up going home to to employees and just hanging out for years if not decades yep and now within the last 
I think since Larry's whole collection went yes. on sale is really when that's changed. That's for sure. It's definitely not a normal time in the hobby. There's way more prototypes coming out right now than there has been in any time in the past. And obviously eventually those will not, they won't be able to continue, you know? So it's kind of get getting it while the getting's good is what I've been doing. Right. Yeah. Cause that's, I, I just have this feeling that they're, once these disappear and they end up back into the private collections again, we won't see them again for another 20, 25 years. Correct. <clears throat> or unless somebody passes away and it goes up. But I mean, this is uh, just amazing what we're seeing here tonight, folks. So Brian is asking how many went home with employees and were given <laughs> to kids for or grandkids to play with. I, I think there's some validity to that. I mean, there's probably untold numbers. I know in the Larry Wood collection, there was something like five or 6,000 prototypes ranging from the very early of the early 1967 all the way up until Larry Wood when he was done, basically, and when he came back as a contractor. So, and he was, you know, just another one of the employees at the time. I say that, but, you know, so he... <laughs> Yes, yeah, so obviously with privileges, but you know that other people were also sne sneaking them home also. So other employee collections have been found. You know, there's been the, the Luis collection and the Brian, uh, the Schultz collection, the Bruce Schultz, and, you know, a couple others that have come up. I was going to say, I've got a couple of Luises. Yeah. Um, I got a paint sample and a couple FEP MR2s, but it's just really kind of weird how all of this is just now coming out and what we're getting to see with. And I think Brian makes a good point there. So let's keep going with the, the Auburn. What, after we get these, uh, whether you want to call them paint samples or pre-production, what happens next? Well, we kind of skipped over a couple steps here. So actually, mm -hmm. after you do the original approval sample, they make patterns. And we can show the patterns later when we talk talking about the classic cord. But from the patterns, and they make an acetate which is, it looks almost like soapstone. And this is actually, this is another one from the Larry Wood collection. This is the acetate of the Auburn 852. And if you notice, it's almost a solid body. I'm just going to throw that down apparently, but there's no ah. windshield on it. It was not <laughs> over there. It didn't just break, thankfully. <laughs> so, Ken's over here having a heart attack. It's all right. Oh, my. Toys, man. But I know, but these are... These are very close. They have a lot of the details on the bottom, but not all of the details. You know, there's no dry shaft. There's no, you know, trademarking information on the bottom of it. But that's that would be the next step after the patterns. Okay. So then from there, then you would make a resin. And the resins are often the catalog cars. Now, if you start looking at a lot of the papers, old books and magazine articles and everything else, they are loaded with prototypes. Yep. And I can't verify this one because it so perfect to the actual production piece but this is actually the resin from larry wood collection this is all solid you know it's not metal at all everything is painted by hand you know you can see the base of it is you can see the colors underneath it where they painted so but this one would more than likely one of the catalog cars but again because it is so awesomely painted from the photographs that they had back in the day it's very hard to tell if it was actually one of the prototype or the catalog cars but I do have one later that is for sure a catalog car, which is very cool. Nice. So one of the things that I, I guess the question I have is when you get these resin prototypes, and I think I may have forgotten what I was going to ask. This sucks. Um, you're, um, how, I guess really the question becomes is how do they get these resin prototypes, say from California to Hong Kong or Malaysia or wherever they were being built in the production facilities at the time, or, you know, in that approval process, because now it's just a attach a picture and send it an email. So how did they right. do that and still manage the car to survive? So at least back in the day, most of the prototyping or all the prototyping was done in California. Okay. So they would make the tooling from industrial design affiliates, who was actually the stamp on the bottom of the, the sketches that I had. And they would make the tooling, and I would have to assume that they would send the tooling to the manufacturer, the uh, actual the factory, yes. Okay. So, and if we go to the Redline stuff, it does not exist on the classic cords, but there's a lot of Redline casting that do have differences. I haven't quite understood that one because I've grown up in the design process and how mm -hmm. vastly different some of them are, and I've never been able to get a good answer why, say, for instance, the Volkswagen 
is completely different. The U.S. versus the Hong Kong. Well, when you say Volkswagen, which one are you referring to? Just the so in 1968 they had the custom Volkswagen, the Red Line, the Beach Bomb. No, the custom okay. Volkswagen. Just it's a Beetle. Oh, the Beetle. Okay. So the, the Beach Bomb was only made in Hong Kong. Okay. See, Red Line for you. Mm -hmm. But the Volkswagen, the custom VW, it was made both U.S. and Hong Kong, and they are drastically different the way they assemble, the way the body is, everything. So paint is another thing I've heard a lot about with yep. the Hong Kong cars. Yep. So I know a little. Okay, so how did Mattel get the cars to there you go? <laughs> Custom Volkswagen. Yes. And this is a USA sixty eight, so with sunroof. You can tell because of the wind. You can tell by a lot of stuff on the Volkswagen. Well, windshield is the one thing that I was always told. <laughs> windshield. Clear okay. windshield, U.S. Yes. Okay, so my uh, next question is, is how did Mattel get them down to the 164 scale and, and do it in a way to still keep costs down? How did they do that? Oh, man, they did not keep costs down. Wow. <laughs> they did not. So the way that they would have to get – the they were basically – more interested in detail it seems like so there's actually papers that i have seen from the 70s about this process and if you kind of extrapolate you know inflation and in dollars for dollars it cost about seventy thousand dollars i believe is the number in today's money to make the initial molds for each casting which that's pretty good change you know that's not something that you're just going to burn through all the time so most of them by the time that most castings by the time they got to the pattern process they're going full production, but there are some patterns that have been found that never made it to actual production, which I think those are extra cool. Did they? Did some of those eventually make it into production? Just like, okay, well, it's 25th anniversary. Let's just... They're terrible about that. They should do stuff like you that. You would think, so, man, we're going to get on a side tangent here, we'll, but... Uh, we'll get back to that. Ooh, we do that all okay. the time. How <laughs> did they get... How did they get down from into that 164 size so and, and still keep the detail okay so you start and this is what we mentioned by patterns this is a they call it a 4x and there's two parts to it let's see this thing is huge if you can't tell i got a, i've got a pretty big head so that gives you an idea of the size of this thing and this is the wood the wood pattern the block of the classic cord that this was made in like 1969 or 1970 a year or two before the actual cord was finally into production these are exceedingly wow. rare there's maybe wow. 50 patterns or so total known to exist and you're going to see a couple of them tonight which i am like beyond proud to own these guys wow. and he showed up in an employee collection in california a couple years ago and thankfully i didn't have to fight the whole world for the two that i got I had some really good friend help me out with that one so anyways this is the wood one so they would make it a much larger scale 4x than mm -hmm. a normal one was so then they could get all the details into it and that's similar to how they make coins they make you know when they're proofing a new coin in the mint they make it much larger okay and then from there that they can hand carve all the details which they end up doing in this so from this one the pattern they make what's called the shell and that's this next guy which is like my prized possession here so excuse me but this is the shell of the classic cord there you go so this wow. one, based off the pattern, they make this, and this has all the individual detail parts. That Yeah, it's huge. So this has all the parts just like the real one would. You know, the hood comes up, the top comes off, the base. It's basically like a big unspun, and it's made out of resin and wood, and it's all handmade. And then from this, they would use a, what's called a pantograph machine, and that would basically trace along all of the parts on here and then carve it into a, a mold to get all the detail down, but then scale it down to quarter size of this, which is now the regular size of what you know as a Hot Wheel. Man, that's so this cool. is this is my baby. I wish I was now, there. You mentioned that pent <laughs> you mentioned that pentagraph machine. Um, would they always come out exactly the way that Mattel had de designed them, or the designers d did, or after a while? Um, they would just have to say, you know what, we need to go back to the pattern and redo. 
I think I think they usually came out exactly because they spent, as, as I said, they spent a ton of money getting the patterns made. And at that point, they're pretty well locked into a design and what they're looking for. There still are some small changes that happen after the fact. But for the most part, the casting, I would say, is probably 95, 99 percent right. what you end up seeing on production floor. Gotcha. Uh, somebody says uh, show and tell, <laughs> field trip. That's hot, Will Hunter. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> yep. Okay. So once that's gone through that pantograph machine and essentially you've got your mold to start production, how many times could they use that mold? So that's one of the reasons they do a lot of the final run stuff. I don't know the exact number, but a lot of times when they did the final run, there may be cost issues with licensing with whoever they had to get approvals from mm -hmm. or the mold may just be plain worn out. So they have to introduce a new casting because they just used it so much and it wasn't enough of a seller for them to make another one basically. But as far as how many they could run, I honestly, I'm not even sure. Okay. So that makes me lead into another question because we were talking about the bug and how they're different between U.S. and Hong Kong, do you think that maybe there was two different molds and that's why those differences exist? Or is it more along paint and windshield and interior and wheels type stuff? So the 68s are a little bit different. And my understanding is there is no such thing as a pattern for the 68 cars. And I may be mistaken on this, but the reason being, if you actually look at the 68 cars, they were all based off of real cars or show cars of the day. And they actually use the AMT, I think, brand models. Okay. And instead of making patterns and all that, they basically copied those and just kind of California customized them a little bit and sent them out. So the earlier ones tend to have more differences and variations in them. And as they got along to 69, 70, 71, there are fewer variations in castings and everything else because they're getting the process worked out. Right. Right. So that makes sense. The early ones, like, and that's why casting like the 60. The 67 Camaro, the original Redline Camaro, there are so many variations on that, not just color and interior, but casting variations, you know, different kidney bean and tab base and As all kinds. As smoothing out the Correct. process and yeah. refining it. Door handles, on door was, handle. Uh, no, yeah, all of that stuff. Brian is saying it's really cool to see how we're getting to look at all this old school way of doing it and how it all started and how it's so much simpler now it but, is but yet more complicated at the same time i think so i for for work i'm a cad designer and you would think that i would love all you 3d printed cad design models but i don't at all <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's got their own niche but they just they are not the same to me to me these older ones that they all had to hand make are just art they really are because they i mean they spent hundreds of hours on each individual one to make them and get them to production. And now if you don't like something on a program, you just, you know, modify a dimension real quick and just print another one. And in two hours, you've got another prototype made. Yep. So, you know, feel free everybody to hop in and ask questions or make comments. Adam is here to answer those for you. Um, yeah. I know it might be a little overwhelming because it's, this isn't our normal area, but this <laughs> is a great chance to, to learn and a great chance to get to see some really awesome stuff. So after they, I mean, where are we at right now? So Because we go from this down to the resins and whatnot, and then we make our molds. How do they come about with the paint choices, and how do they put that paint on? And Or where are we at next? What do you, oh, man. So I guess next would be another early production or early prototype. And this one is going to be hard to explain, but this is actually an early prototype of the Classic Chord. This one actually came from the Robert Rosas collection. This was one of them that he had for quite a while, apparently. But the production cords never came with a black top, or never came with an orange top. They're always black. But if you investigate this one further, which unfortunately I can't really show on here, there's actually internal differences on this one that you can tell, which actually, if you start looking, they match the pattern. <laughs> which I think is awesome. So that means that there were a couple different they had to do to make after the original molds were made. So there's a few of these out there. I know of about three of them that are similar to this one, but they don't match production at all. Everybody's just, they're, they're, 
you've warped their fragile little minds. <laughs> they're toy cars, guys. It doesn't matter how much they cost. They're still toy cars. I'll tell you what, this prototype that I just showed you, I raced that in Las Vegas last year and almost won the downhill races with it. So I'm not afraid to play with them either. See, now, the reason that – I'm, I'm, ag- I'm agreeing – like, like Hollow Hunter just says that his, 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 his head is spinning right now, and I said me too. And the only reason I say that is because, I mean, sure, I have prototypes behind me, and I think I've got five of them back there, but they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're just paint variations and, and stuff like that that were just test ideas. They are not the, you know, from the acetate to the, the proto, you know, you know, the huge wood. No, they're not nothing like that because I don't know if they did that for the Mercedes back then, but I'm assuming they didn't. And if they did, so they I don't did know where the, they they used the pattern process and this same general process up in through the Blackwall era. I don't know when the exact cutoff was, but I know up in, at least until the eighties they were still using panographed wood patterns that were four X and basically making going the exact same path. They were smoothing it down so they didn't have as many, you know changes along the way but they were getting the process down for sure so the problem is is there's stories of in the i think 90s or early 2000s that supposedly had tons of these patterns at the factory in california and they just trashed them all because they were just old junk <laughs> right so that's what the story is is supposedly they threw hundreds of these things away maybe 20 30 years ago because they didn't realize that people were that into it and would love to own these things yeah. so the only ones that are survived are ones that got out before then or ones that people found later Grant, yeah your, because oh there you are because you know this is but this, on the same the, token the, the, since you brought it up there's there's this? there's prototype of the production process and there's also a prototype of each new release and after they've got the original production process down then most of your variations for prototypes are just going to be the different colors and wheels and stuff like that right so if we yeah. backtrack a little bit and go back to approvals you have an approval of the classic chord and this would have come before the patterns. And this one also came from the Bob Rosas collection. Okay. And this one, if you look, there's no blower on it yet, you know, sticking through the hood. Uh, there's actually a license plate mounted on the front. Hopefully you guys can see the license plate and actually there's one on the rear too, or the bumpers are different on the rear. I should say, sorry. But this one is actually quite a bit different than the production piece, and it's actually quite a bit smaller. You know, I would say it's about 90% the size of an actual production one. But this was the approval sample of the cord. So they would go from acetate approval piece, then into the patterns and the drawings and all that. I guess it's for sale. <laughs> I, would. I guess it's sold. Oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> So I know what I paid now. I'll sell any one of my cars for if you had a zero to the price of it. <laughs> no. So not, not, not for what for. Yeah. And believe me, none of these were none of the red line ones were, were in the hundred dollar range. They were far north of that. So minor continue, minor from the eighties. This is actually my, not... actually my newest piece. Um after the patterns are made, then for catalog and advertising, they make a brass piece. Now, brass pieces are also extremely rare. And again, there's probably 40 or 50 brass pieces known from the Redline era, but they only made one of them. These took 200 to 400 hours a piece to make, and it's kind of a combination of parts made from the pattern and parts that are handmade. So this one, again, came from the Bob Rosas collection. This is actually a catalog car. If you have the original club kit that came out in 19, what is it, 1970, they had the yeah. Chrome, Boss Hoss, Heavy Chevy, and King Cuda. Yeah. If you open to the middle of the very middle of the book, there's a pullout that's like a poster. And this car is actually pictured on that very insert. So this is the brass of the classic core. This is my most recent acquisition. And I am just like insanely proud for this one. It was Hard to get to, but I finally nailed it down and actually got it just about a month ago. But this is almost entirely brass. The base is brass, but it is painted. The body is brass. The engine is basically a production engine. The roof is handmade and is completely different from the real one. And when you start looking at it, because they were just for photographs, they didn't need a bunch of details. So, like, there's 
all the details on the trunk are missing. There's no door lines for the trunk. There's no license plate, any of that goodness. There's no door lines in the, on the side where the doors would normally be. There's a whole bunch of differences in the brass piece from the regular one. It just amazes me to see how, how much they changed it just to get a picture of it and then to sit here and go, how did that survive, you know, all that time? And now we're getting to see all the steps to get there. It's just amazing. All right, try this one on. Put your hand out here, man. Now feel how heavy this one is. That's an acetate. That's pretty light, yeah. right? There's no weight to it. And then this is a production one, mostly, as far as we're concerned. So it's, it's a got, heavier. got quite a bit of heft. And the brass piece is weigh about 20% more than the Zamac ones. Holy cow, that's different. It's weird, <laughs> isn't it? Well, so, you don't, I never knew when until I got it, you know, you hear that they are, but I actually weighed them and I don't have the numbers here with me, but they, there is a, a measurable difference in the weight of the two. And I actually had a challenge out to one of my friends that if he brought one of his brass cars to Vegas, I would race this one against his, but I don't think he'll do it. So Good. their well, client has a great question. How fragile are these? I am less concerned about the brass one than I am the acetate or the silver pattern, the silver pattern being resin and hollow just like a normal one, it honestly scares me to travel with. So I've done it a few times. I took it to a show, the show in Vegas, and I've done that, I think, once, maybe twice. I think just once. But I actually have a Pelican case made for that to travel with, and it's sitting over here. It's the, it's the size of a travel carry-on, and that's all that is in it is my two patterns. That's it. And <laughs> call it crazy, but no. it, it just it terrifies me. So when I bought these, actually, I bought them from a friend, and they were in California. I had to pick them up in ba in California. So I actually, I'm cheap. I'm poor. But I upgraded to first class to fly home, so I had guaranteed didn't have to check a bag because there was no way I was <laughs> checking that car. Oh, no. So I actually had a panic attack the night before about doing that and actually was talking to a friend of mine about driving home from L.A. in a rental car, and he was willing to do it with me. But thankfully, I just upgraded to first class, and then you're guaranteed – so it was a much easier ride. So the question here, does resin cause cancer in the cars? And what I'm thinking is rust or holes or anything like that. Chipping. So the resin and the acetate, the smaller ones are solid. You know, it's like you took almost like a bar of soap and just carved it from that. There's no hollow cavities in most of them, at least the, the ones I've shown so far. So there's, and a lot of them like the acetate, they don't even have wheels in them. But no, there's no, there's no, I mean, it, I don't think... You can agree that, that the really axles good. are still nice and shiny even yeah. after 50 years. I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not, but I'll try. But you can hopefully see the axles. There's no rust or anything going on in, in the axles that are just kind of held in place by tension. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at Hot Wilson's Hunter's comment. Because I, I, he's not wrong. They're still just toys, guys. Holy but cow. You know, exactly what, what you're saying, though. It, they, they are just toys, and they're all about having fun. So... It's just, it's one of those things like, you know, I guess what I, because I went ahead and posted, you know, there's, you know, before it was like, you know, it was like, you know, if you guys want to see some crazy stuff, you need to get into this live video tonight because, you know, the odds of you ever getting a chance to see this stuff again are probably slim to none. So, you know, that's why I went ahead and made an additional post that it's like, I mean, like, like Ken said, unless you, unless you, unless you go to your house, the odds of anyone ever seeing these again outside of a book or probably slim to none. So it's really cool. <laughs> the the cool thing is I've got to touch a couple cars. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, like I said, I, I wish I was there. there. <laughs> you know, I wish I, I was sure there. I washed my hands thoroughly. So Good idea. And Spencer's mom is here and we'll just say happy birthday again. We may get to see him in Lincoln as well. So Happy birthday to you, young man. Happy birthday. That was a couple of days ago, but awesome gifts there. Okay, so what do we got next? All right, so now after they make that orange roof, I know we kind of skipped around a little bit. It's kind of hard to do. Then you basically go into production, and this is a unpainted, unspun body of the classic cord from 1971, and this has been... This has been zinc plated, so it's not just raw Zamac, but the zinc plating is what they, they used on the Spectrum Flame cars to give it all the shine. But 
as much as I would love this to be a prototype, it is not. It's just a very cool unspun body from back in the day, which unspuns are pretty rare also. They're just not on the same level as the others. But I like stuff like this because it shows all the internals of the car and everything that they had to do. And having cars like this help you investigate stuff like the orange roof and know what you're really looking at and look for differences. And that is actually how I have another painted unspun. I had it first. And that's how I learned about the differences on the orange roof is having more versions of it to compare to. Right. So then the next one, it was basically like production. This is a basically the same thing. This is a magenta color, classic cord, and this one is unspun. So this one, you can take it apart. The posts never got the, the posts, which are the stems that stick down. There's one on the front there and one on the back. Those stick through the base. And then we'll see if we can show it here. There we go. And I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but the post is sticking through the base. And yeah. then they would spin. There's not actually a rivet there, but they would spin that. And that's why they call them spun or unspun. Yeah. But this one is just per pure production, but it just never got assembled <laughs> final stamp. But again, this was one this originally this was one of my grail cars. <laughs> <laughs> when I got it, I couldn't believe I owned an unspun classic cord. Now I want to see the base again. Now, I Go ahead. this is the part that really gets me because if you are into older Matchbox cars, you will see that the this is how most of their suspensions were. Except they used instead of plastic, they used a thin piece of metal, and they could move that back and forth, and that's how we got the tires out. I, I thought that was kind of cool. So here you go. We'll, we'll, we'll take the pattern apart real quick. Give me a second here. And the pattern is accurate enough that it even has the strip. So if you look at this, it, it's attached. Oh, good God. You can see that white strip in there. And this is the inside of the pattern. So you can see they've even you know got the tailpipes carved in and the bumpers and everything. I mean, it is exactly how it would be. And then it matches... There's still some some slight differences, but you get to see how similar they actually are to the actual production, the actual production pieces, which I love this this side of it. Okay, so does resin cause cancer in humans? I would guess not, or California would not allow them to make them. <laughs> this is true. Right? They'd have a Proposition 65 sticker on all these, and they don't. <laughs> uh, I did not drool on them. It's okay. I have. And uh, <laughs> we're sorry that you can't make it. And uh, Walker, eat your heart out. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh -oh, I'm not getting into that one. <laughs> Is Walker in here? <laughs> He's in here tonight. So about the last what? thing I have to show for classic chords is... And Mattel, I don't know if they still do, but they had a basically a place called the Model Shop. And the Model Shop, they would kind of play with ideas and concepts. And there was an employee there named Larry Cox. And one year at the Model Shop, they had a contest, and they were basically instructed to modify a car, a production car, with parts from other cars. And we're going to have a race. And we're going to see who can modify something and make it fastest. So then this... Call it the lunchtime cord. It's kind of sort of half famous, but it's hokey as all get out, but I love it. And this one, his idea was to carve out the rear fenders and put big old rumbler wheels on the back of it. Oh. And this is a hack job if I ever saw one, but I know the providence of it. So, I mean, he had it, you know, it's a screwed together, you know, but he just, I mean, he hacked the fenders up to get those wheels to fit. It's terrible, but it's awesome at the same time. That's probably one yeah, of the first customs ever done. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty so cool. So it's interesting. I have a, you know, because you get plugged in with certain guys, and he actually has uh, a super fine turbine that has the same type of wheels on it. And he later found some documents of Mattel. Basically, that was a, a memo that was sent out to the designers is, you know, what can we use that we've already got to make new versions of it that are different? And I'm not saying that this is the same thing, but it kind of shows that they were always thinking along those lines, even back, you know, the super fine turbines from 1973 and the cords from 71. But, again, the concept is there that they're always playing with ideas at the model shop, and you just never know what they're going to come up with. Does it roll? No. not It's terrible. Oh. It is awful <laughs> on the track. I tried it. It, it like, skid to the bottom of the track, and as soon as there was no more elevation, it stopped. 
<laughs> I have a video on YouTube of me trying to race this thing, and it didn't go well. I've made a complete fool of myself. I just think it's funny. Is, is the car was so, built and designed for a downhill race, and it don't roll. <laughs> well, there's winners and losers of every race, buddy. Yes, there is. It's got to be hot with a hunter, right? Um, no, it's Steve and Nikki, actually. Oh, okay. Hi, Steve. So if Glad we want to continue you. on to the cord, we may bring stuff back in a little bit more towards you guys' neck of the woods here. So as you know, the Redline Club has been making cars, and they've been revamping a lot of the original Redlines. And one of those, obviously, is a classic cord, and I've been fortunate enough to grab a couple of those. And all these came not direct from employee collections, so they came from eBay and some other guys that I knew. So the first one up here is actually – so go back. Mattel apparently has terrible bookkeeping. They did not keep drawings of any of this stuff. So when they decided they wanted to remake this stuff, for example, the, the Superfine Turbine, when they wanted to remake that, they actually had to get the drawings back from my friend to make <laughs> it. So he provided it to them so they could make their casting again because he had better bookkeeping or documentation than they did. So that wow. makes me have a great question uh -oh. that, that you just talked about. Out of all of this stuff... Is this the, Mattel didn't care because they didn't mark it as intellectual property at that point? Did did it belong to the designer or did it belong to Mattel, or did they care? I don't know that they really cared at the time because what they cared about was selling toy cars, right? So I think, and I don't know for sure, but I think that's the only way that some of these older employees and nowadays it's vastly different. I was going to say. So in the earlier days, we know there you, you start to hear stories about Larry Wood and Rosas and some of the other designers of the stuff that they got to do back in the day and how they came to, you know, make some of these cars. But yeah, originally it was not that big of a deal. Okay, so an example is a Turismo and the DeLorean. Yes, that's right. Great, so yeah. So the, you know, they wanted to make it the DeLorean. They they got apparently some sort of agreement with DeLorean. And they started making it, and then DeLorean pulled their licensing from it, so they had to modify it, and it came out as a Turismo. It's not actually a DeLorean, wink, wink, but everybody knows that's what it is. Well, yeah. But they had to change it just enough, and it's kind of a similar thing. And that's when you start getting into intellectual properties is when they started. Well, I mean, they've gotten in trouble for it with that from the beginning because the 69 Corvette's the first great example of that when the, yeah. the designs for it were snuck out of. So there's an interview on YouTube somewhere, and it's basically Larry Wood, I believe it was him saying that he basically, because he used to work for GM before he worked for mm -hmm. Hot Wheels, and he got basically went back to GM and took a drawing from their design center and went back to Mattel, and that's how they made it, and that's how they were able to make it before. It wasn't actually Larry. It was the guy who designed the 69 Corvette for Mattel, Okay, and he was also a... Was it Ira Guilford, maybe? It wasn't Ira. No, okay, it was, anyways. It was like the second guy they ever hired. So, yeah, I can't remember his had, name. It was just guy, on. Uh, he was just on the hot, the History Channel special. They were talking about it, okay. but he yeah. had the fifty. He had the sixty-five show that they used for a, a casting. So anyway, so to go back to the Redline Club making them, they've obviously revamped, revamped the cord, and this is the blank base prototype of the Hot Wheels or Redline Club release. If you notice, they never actually made it in this color. It's uh, like a sky blue, I guess I would call it. Now, it still has the same tampos as the original blue one, but this one is a different color, and it's also got a blank base. So again, there's no copyright information or text or anything whatsoever on the base. So that was one of the early versions of the classic chord when they redid it for the Redline Club. And that would have been in 2004. And when they were doing this, that's <laughs> correct. And then when they were doing this, if you want to get real cozy, oh, sorry, 2005, I guess. Does that say five or is that three? I can't read this one. Well, this may, five. they may have done it for another release. I'm not I'm not as good on the newer stuff. Yeah, this one has five. 2004 stamped on the bottom of it. Well, so remember they were designing them at that point, so then that would have meant it come out in 05 or 06. Good point. So, yeah. Okay, so this one is another paint sample, and it's marked J uh, January 28, 2005, and this one is close to the production color. But it's actually just a shade different, and I hopefully you guys can read the text on the side there, the pen marks. And this is also another unspun paint sample in a non-production color of the classic okay. cord. But there's no hood, and this one actually it matches very closely the internals, almost exactly. Yeah, 
you know, I'm showing him Kent here a little bit of it, yeah. but it's hard. Wow. It's going to be hard to show on it. But yeah, this is almost, it's basically an exact replica. The top and the glass are slightly different. They changed that a little bit, probably for ease of manufacturing nowadays and modern processes, but. Okay. So we do have a question. He goes, how many of each casting do you own? Of the Auburn, the oh my Accord, gosh. and well, so I've seen a little bit of the craziness. Okay, so I own for classic chords, I own 39 classic chords. I have basically one of each color and then the prototypes that I've found. So my goal was to fill a salesman case. In 1973, they made wood cases for the salesman. And there's about 25 or so of those cases known to exist, and I managed to acquire one of those from a friend. And my goal was to fill it with classic chords. So I just recently with the brass one was number 36 in that car, in that case. And I got my two patterns that make 38. And I have one more that is for the event in Vegas. So I'm, I have 39 wow. classic chords. Um, now, as far as the other stuff, the Auburns and the Doozies and a couple, you know, similar related classic castings, I got hundreds of those. Because I get bored at shows and I still like to go to toy shows, even though you don't really find classic chord prototypes at the toy shows. <laughs> no, but you find lots so. of uh, cool dodges at all. At yeah, all. there you go. So, I mean, I, I still go to the toy shows and all that. And I'll just basically, if they're if they're priced right, I'll buy every Auburn Court Duesenberg at a toy show. So, I've got hundreds and hundreds of, of those. And I've got, <laughs> I'm, I'll post some pictures on the club forum here when I get home or tomorrow of, you know, like it'll be a drawer of nothing but Auburns. And they'll hold a couple hundred Auburns in each drawer. They're actually old engineering document files. Nice. So, yeah, I, I so to get back on though. with the production side <laughs> of it. Yeah, I think they're cool. It's kind of obsessive, but it's a way to keep busy at shows and still go to them and buy stuff, even though it's something I don't need. Yeah. Um, you travel in the armored card with these. <laughs> I'm a fairly stout guy. I don't think a lot of people are going to be messing with me. No. <laughs> I think yeah, no. you use public transportation. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> So the next one of the other releases of the classic chord from Redline Club was the gold one. This is what the what do they call it? the I, the I, choice, whatever yeah. they call those, the you know the voters' Selection. choice or whatnot. Oh, so, the selections car. There you go, the Redline Club selection. So this is one of those, and this is an FEP of that, and this is almost identical to the production one, but this one has the hang tag with it. It has a little bit of information on the hang tag, which I think is just super awesome. Let's see, there we go. I'm still learning the cameras, guys. So I hear you, man. So we're still and learning. Actually, what I really like about these FEPs from the Redline Club is they're marked. So this one's marked uh, 001. So I can only assume that that hopefully that shows that that is the first FEP for this one. And I actually have another one that does not have a hang tag, and it is marked 003. So I just think that's super cool too. That you get even even with prototype stuff in pre-production, you can still get little variation differences. Hopefully, it shows. You can see it a little bit, it's but it's such a mirror out. base that it's just picking up everything in the background. I know. So the one with the tag is Mark 001, and then the other one is Mark 003, and I've heard that they would make 12 FEPs. So, you know, maybe if a guy was lucky, he'd be able to get all of them, but I'm pretty happy with two. Especially I'd two be happy with one. Together. I know. Well, I mean, just this, having number the, the one alone. The guy that alone. had these, he had a toolbox full of these things. It was it was awesome. You know, you send a, he's, somebody sent me a picture of it. And I'm scanning through of all the Redline Club FEPs and prototypes that were in there. And I was like, hey, how much for those two? And ended up buying them from them. And they ended up being super cool. So, you know, that's another great question is now as you've progressed and started picking these up and adding them in, has the market for these changed? Is the demand there or has, the, has it become inflated and bloated like everything else right now? I would say... Like everything, it fluctuates a great deal. Right. So I don't, I mean, the Auburns and the Doozies, quite frankly, have never been a popular casting. I love them. But you collect what you like, you know, and for the most part, it worked out for me pretty well because, you know, most of them are very easy to find. You can just go buy Buku's of them for, you know, a dollar to five dollars a piece. But for the most part, those have pretty well stayed stagnant. And then there's a couple outliers, obviously, like the Leo Doozies. Those are very tough. And yeah. those have, with Leo prices skyrocketing, have gone up. Mm -hmm. But the classic chord, actually, okay, here's a tidbit. The classic chord was the very first car that Mattel ever made with thinking of collectors in mind. Okay. Why that car? Because at the time, classics were very popular in the real world in one-to-one -one cars. Everybody was wanting the cars from the 20s and 30s. And despite the popularity with the kids in California with the muscle cars, 
the classics, what were, we're bringing real money on the, the auction market at the time, you know, cause in 1967, 1967 Camaros were not collectible. They were just another new car. They were cool cars, yeah. but yeah. they weren't anything special, but the cords were starting to gain collectability. So they chose that one and trying to basically combine two markets of the classic car collector and bring them into hot wheels. And that was the very first car that they made with that in mind as with, a collectible with car. the intent to collect. Correct. That's, that was their first all the way back in 1970. When they first started thinking about the core, they were already starting to say, how can we get adults into collecting? If that tells you anything. And it took them, you know, until 1995 to make series. But even back then they were thinking about it. Right. I mean, I, it just amazes me how, forward thinking Elliot Handler was and on some things. So uh is that a fat joke? <laughs> and that, 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 when I walk in. And that's from Greg Sully, if you know the name. <laughs> uh, Pink Gallery is here. Oh, okay. The squirrel has arrived. <laughs> Let's see. Well, back I had these kinds of uh, No, I've never sent anything to Adam. Well, I see how does he got a hoard here? I need to find. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee I got a few of them there, somewhere. You, there, there are a few floating around in here. They're mainly over in that. Uh, he showed me some. He doesn't know this, but I stashed one in his room that he's got to find sometimes. So, ha ha. Crap. <laughs> Well, I, and so this is the thing is, when he finds it, I'm sure he'll stay up tonight until he does. You know, behind me, I've actually got two. I got two Auburns and two Cadillacs right there. My sister. Um, so I mean, I, I literally have four of them in my case behind me. I've got the maroon Cadillac, the pink and silver Cadillac, the yellow with the dark maroon fenders, and the red with the red fenders <clears throat> for the Auburns right behind me. Okay, really Klein has a question, and he, he's wanting to know about what can you say about modern, modern RLC prototype cars and their no interior and color variation? So as much as I know about the Auburn Scores and Doozies, I really don't know a whole lot about the other ones. Now, obviously, the Redline Club prototypes are still collectible, but as far as, say, the, this paint, the, the paint sample that I have, which is the blue one versus just the unspun body that I have. When I bought these two, the Redline Club one had one less zero in the price of it compared to the original unspun body. If that, and I don't know if that's kind of answering your question or not, but they're they are they don't hold the same value as the original Redline ones, but they do hold Makes more sense. value than your regular ones. Ooh, Greg uh, just purchased a just Greg. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah he, he finished off the red line that's of Well, no, because Greg just finished off the turbo so fire, and I just got to start on something else. So he had her different interior colors. So on the red line club ones, I'm really not sure on that one, to be honest. On the original red lines, they have different colors of interiors and there are definitely colors of interiors like for the Camaro that a green interior is early run and you get into like blue interiors and brown and other stuff so as far as the original red lines I can speak to those but I honestly I'm not that knowledgeable on the red line club stuff unfortunately but interior on even red lines so for the classic cord say a red classic cord is we'll say a $350 car with black interior but if you get a the Mexican one made by Sipsa with a white interior, that's about a four thousand dollar car by just basically changing the color of the interior and the top is the main difference. But the body is exactly the same, but it it adds significant value. But there's only maybe four or five sips of cords that are red known to exist. So that's crazy. Okay, and good evening to you <clears throat> as well. So since we're going to talk doozies, I can show you. I do have an acetate for the doozy. Now, this one is kind of interesting because it's not a solid block. It is actually like ba what I call the chassis. It was basically what the base and the fenders would be as one piece. And that's the original. This one actually also came from Larry Wood, but it does not have the body molded in like the Auburn did, which I always thought was kind of odd. But it's still a very cool piece. I wish it was complete, but at the same time, sometimes you just take what you can get. Mm -hmm. So I have that small piece. And then as far as patterns, I was actually joking around with Tim Watterson, who was, he goes by Got Toys for You on eBay. I talked to him quite a bit. 
And I was bugging him that he needed to find me a pattern. He needed to find me a pattern. And then in the Larry Woods stuff, there was just boxes of parts. And in those, as far as I got for the pattern for the doozy was two pieces. <laughs> and again, you take what you can get, but this is the, the pattern, the roof pattern for the, wow. the doozy. And then this is the interior piece for the doozy. But that's as far as I've been able to get on the doozy for the pattern. But again, I thought it was cool enough and he sent them to me, thankfully. And until I had my cords, these were some of my favorite pieces. And then the cord patterns about two months later, he sent me a message. It'll make a guy's heart drop. If you're a collector that, you know, he said, you know, you've always been bugging me about getting you a pattern. And he sent me the picture of it and, you know, about had a stroke because you know what you were <laughs> looking at. Yeah, so, you don't need that. I don't need that at all. And then because I'm not doing uh, CPR. No, thankfully. And then this is a prototype of the doozy. Also, this is a Zamac. It is spun, and it the body, as far as I could tell, is correct and are are the same as the production, but it does have a different roof, and that is, uh, it's textured and black instead of smooth and tan like the Redline ones did. This one also came from an employee collection. It made the rounds by a few guys until it landed with me, and, well, it's not going anywhere. But yeah. that's that's the earliest complete red line doozy that I have. So you're saying it found its forever home. Yeah, pretty much. Most of these cars have. So what time is the drawing for the prototype cord? <laughs> <laughs> Go stand by your mailbox. It'll be there soon. <laughs> and then you're supposed to swap five or six cars around. I'll tell you right now, you could, and I'd never find them. My sister did this, did that to me. And the Zamac is sexy. Well, I agree. Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, we got them hooked up there. It's all right. They'll survive. <laughs> so, um, what else do we've got to show oh, off man. tonight? All right. So, let's see. Where to go next? Sorry, guys. I'm still thinking. I'm going to stick with a couple casting we've talked about. So I guess another one that I can show, if we go back to Cord real quick, I got too much stuff here, guys. Hey, that's fine. That's really cool. I'll sit here until my phone dies. So this is so. an FEP of the classic Cord, the green one. Maybe this, no, this one was the selections one. The, the red or the gold cords were the real writers ones. I stand yeah. corrected. Yeah, the true. Right. The selection ones. And this is an FEP that I got at the convention a few years ago. And it's basically a production one on a blank card from Medline Club, and it has some markings on the back for FEP and some type of code that I don't really know what it means. But that's just another step in the process. And these generally are the same as production. They're just, again, another neat little step along the way. Yeah, because that one was part of a four-part set. I have for the classic core. What was that? I said that, that the green one was part of the four-car set that had, it was – it was the Cord, there was a Mustang, there was a 36 Ford, and I want to say there was a Corvette. And, a and, all, then, and the background picture, like, matched all the way across. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what that one was. Okay. So, what can you tell me about your involvement with Redline Jackpot? What is it, first of all, and what? how are you... Part, how do you participate in it? So the Redline Jackpot, to go back to its original history, is in around 2004, 2005, there was a website called Redlines Online. I was the kid of the group at the time. You know, I was in college, high school. And they wanted to do a Redline-only event. So a couple of the guys from SoCal started up a show in Vegas in February, and they did it for two or three years. And it is Redlines only, and they rent – basically similar to a convention you know they have a, ho a designated hotel that lets you do room to room trading they have certain events and a dinner and they would try to get some guys to come and speak and and, and it's basically a red line mini convention okay so that went for a couple years and then you know people got busy with life and it kind of took a hiatus and then several years ago a friend of mine anita who runs chick news fabulous red lines you know we all started talking a group of us about revamping it and three years ago, we started it up again in Las Vegas, and it's still at the end of February, and it's actually done pretty good. I've been quite pleased with it. You know, we had 75 or so people show up to the first one and about 100 to the second one, even with COVID starting up. So nice. we'll see how this one goes. But I try to help her with a couple of the events. I run the downhill for pinks, where you have to have an original red line. You have to open it in front of everybody, and then you have to race it. And if you win, you get to take the other guy's car. Wow. So 
there was a minimal buy-in value of the car. It had to be in a certain price range to kind of keep it fair and on the level playing field. So somebody didn't show up with a hundred dollar car and somebody showed up with a thousand dollar car. I think last year was about a two hundred fifty dollar car. So I took a sugar caddy blister pack. I lost to like a twelve year old girl. You know, it was pretty swell. But it was fun. You know, you get to open a red line. You know, the first guy to ever touch that car, and I owned it for like seven minutes and gave it to the girl. <laughs> Man. Yeah, she she almost won the whole thing for the for the racing for paints. You know, she won probably a dozen cars that day of other wow. people. And they're all fresh cars that just got opened. <clears throat> How many noodle heads showed up? A lot. So I'm I'm gonna work on that one because there are certain castings, as he mentioned, the noodle head, the school bus, and there's one or two others that are very heavy. Mm -hmm. I know he's gonna race a school bus because the blister pack of the school bus is all the value of that. You go from like a twenty five hundred dollar car to like a two hundred dollar car by opening that one, but not all of them are that extreme. So, like a number 271 Firebird, then. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the Redline equivalent of that, yes. Yeah. Because because they're so heavy, so many of them just popped off the card. Oh, kind of like how drag it, buses do from time to time. Probably. And, and, then, and this yeah. is the, so anyways, the school bus we're talking about, I have an idea about, right? to try to level the playing field to make it a little more fun. So, it's just year after year, not more noodle heads after noodle head after noodle head. So, this year, we're going to just kind of make it another free-for-all. And then in the following year, which will be year four, I'm going to try to implement some rules to try to give some variety to this, to the races. Right. And I also do the blister pack. BPLA is what we call it. Blister pack liberation army. And that's the other side of it. And that's just kind of the same thing, but you don't get to, you don't race to lose your car. So that's my other event is you just have to have a red line and you kind of, usually there's a question ahead of time. You just kind of tell a little bit about, you know, whatever the question is. And it's more just about fellowship and reminder that they're still just toy cars, even though they're expensive and, you know, sometimes you get some guys that want to just show off, so they try to find the most expensive thing there, and everybody claps and cheers them on. And some people just, you know, are nervous opening a hundred dollar car. And yeah. I was, you know, at the first, actually at the very first jackpot in two thousand four, my first BPLA was a Red Baron. I paid a hundred dollars for it, and I was shaking and just nervous, and I could hardly <laughs> get the thing open. You know, and at this point, I've opened enough red lines that it's kind of whatever. But I would say, uh, as you do it more often it becomes the thrill is always there but the the nervousness about it it's just like whatever yeah and it's fun mm -hmm. and you know some people like i said they get one that they really like and some people just go for uh the cheapest that's got to be greg yes yep that's greg yeah, greg greg and and when we were in yeah. la in so 18 i've always enjoyed the bpla i'm glad that you know it was originated by Dave Lopez and Mark Fletcher back in the day. And, you know, they're not always at the show. So if they're not there, I've tried my best to try to keep it going when I'm there. You know, I really like what they did and what they're, what the intent of it was. So that's another big one. And I've, unfortunately my collecting habits have changed. So all these cars that I've opened at Redline BPLA events, I don't own, but like one of them anymore. So I, you know, black roof boss Hoss and beach bombs and yeah, you know, good stuff, white interior sand crabs, you know, I've opened all that kind of stuff and I don't own a single one of those anymore, but they all got me into the collection I have now. So it kind of works. I was going right. to say they were all probably step stones to refund and recoup so that you could get what you have now and get to show us what we have. Yeah. Right so yeah, I used to have a bunch of red lines and a bunch of other stuff, you know, I had thousands of cars before, but I decided to just focus and I basically fire sold a lot of that and I still had red lines. And then when the patterns came up, I actually, that was my, my ultimate focus point is I needed to come up with some money real fast. So I, I sold the, the the rest of the red lines that I had that were not cords. And I, I didn't have a ton left at that point, but that was the end of me buying just random. Just to have it. Just to have it. You know, I still pick them up through streaming deals, but you know, I don't really look for them anymore. I always just look for cords and I'm just focused. You know, one thing, one part of the design process that we hadn't talked about, and I know you don't have one here. Oh man. Is what do you grid cars? Oh yeah. Grid cars are just, amazing because all of your cars are solid colors correct and if you can explain what a grid car is and why is it important the grid cars are adam envy that's what grid cars are i would love to own a grid car but because the doozy and the auburn and the cord never came with tampos in the era of them doing this their the chances of them having a grid car are slim so the grid cars before cad and everything else they needed a way to basically plot out on the car what the tampo design would look like so they would literally just paint grids on them that were perfect, but they would follow the curvature of the car to make it plottable. So then they could scale it up or down and repeatable. So they would, sometimes they would just take a production car off the line and paint it directly on there. There's a heavy Chevy grid car that is just, I think an aqua heavy Chevy. And it's just got grids painted over the entire thing. 
And then sometimes they would take one of the resin blocks and do a grid on those. So you see a lot of their yellow resin ones mm -hmm. that have the green grid patterns on them. And that was basically so they could map out where the tampos laid and everything else. And that's a, that's a, I believe a Bob Rosas thing is he okay. introduced the tampos to Mattel as a way to spruce them up and, you know, cause it was the enamel stuff was cheaper to do than spectra flame, but they yes. still wanted to add flair to them. Yeah. So they introduced tampos to give some decorations. And I think the machine to do for that came from Germany. If I remember correctly, okay. from what I've heard in past interviews from other, other folks, the other thing is they, my understanding is the grid cars. And I think you explained it a little bit. They were helped. They were on there so that the, tampos wouldn't distort as they were going over the curve. Correct, because obviously cars. Hot Wheels are not flat, so you can't just print a perfect square grid. You know, it has to follow the curves of the car and lay out properly, so that's why they look like that. If you look straight on, it looks perfect, but if you were to actually like unfold that, you, you would notice that the, those lines are not actually as straight as you think they are. Gotcha. So that's how they would come up with those and how they would map them out. So then when they did put it on a curved surface, it actually applied the way they needed it to and looked good. Excellent. And cool. yeah, we had said up there that you need to write a book. <laughs> I have. So Anita also helps out with the toy feather. I don't know if you guys ever look at the toy feather, but it's a cool website. It's mostly die cast and hot wheels and she does blogs on there. And I've put a blog up before about the classic cords it's just a brief history of them. She asked me to revamp it since I got the brass one and include a little bit more, but eventually I'll do that, but we'll see. <laughs> I, I always have another piece on the horizon, so I always feel my collection is incomplete, honestly. I hear you there. <laughs> now I get to tell him there's also something else I put in here that he hadn't found yet either. Well, I haven't found anything yet. Oh, yeah, we got so, I don't. <laughs> you just tell me what you want to see now at this point. We kind of got through the basic of the uh, production process. I guess and we'll, I'll give you a side tangent here. This is, I have two more castings that I collect that I have production process pieces for. The Phaeton looks like it's a... Phaeton, that's a fan of Corsair, man. Phantom Corsair, excuse me. Okay. All right. Who who has the car knowledge? Why do I collect Phantom Corsairs? Oh, I collect I all the were... Duesenberg. Why do I collect Phantom Corsair? Because it was made by Cord, wasn't it? It, no, no, no. The Phantom Corsair was a concept designed by the Heinz family of like Heinz ketchup. ketchup, yeah. And it was basically one of the heirs of that. And he wanted a custom car, and he was his goal was to go into production with it. And it was actually a real car that got made as a prototype. But he wanted to use the most advanced, technologically advanced, and fastest car of the era. Yeah. So he took a thirty-six cord chassis and drive line and put this body onto it. Therefore, it fits into my little niche collection. That's, That's my nice. excuse. What I was going to say was that almost like an eraser. It, yeah. So the Phantom Corsair is another one. I, you know, you kind of get bored because, you know, cars that I'm really looking for don't come up very often. So you take side tracks. So then I end up doing the Phantom Corsair. So there's a resin body of the Phantom Corsair. This one's just raw. You know, it, this one's actually hollow. You can see the post and it's pretty crude on the inside. And I've somehow managed to get about five resins of the Phantom Corsair. You know, so we got a gray paint sample resin of the Phantom Corsair, and it's basically identical. It's just another odd one. And then you get to the black ones, and this is where you start seeing some cool stuff. The black one is the color that they ended up with, and this one actually has a base on it that is plastic. But if you look, those are go-kart size wheels. And the <laughs> real one did not have those little wheels. They had regular wheels on it. Say, yeah. So then yeah. I've got a fourth one here, and it is, it's the same as the last one, but it has the interior that's painted, or a window at least. So I always thought these were super cool, and I had a couple of Phantom Corsairs, and then I went to a trade day in Ohio, and Bruce Pascal was there, and he had some prototypes of newer stuff, and one of those was this resin Phantom Corsair, and that's when it made sense to me. This one also is a resin. And if, if you can tell, hopefully, that this is another one that I have two resins, but they are different size. They're, you know, the, the one, this one is actually quite a bit smaller than the mm -hmm. other one. It does not have the bumpers. Yeah, you it's can see. It's kind of odd, I thought. So, I ended up with, what, one, two, three, four, five of the Phantom Corsair resins somehow. I think there's a couple more out there. G generally, the resins are multiples of. So, if if you see one and you miss it, don't get totally heartbroken because another one will probably pop up. It's just, you know, if and when. That's that's one of the things with, with all of the, you know, it's just when, 
when is another one going to show up? Right. So, like, mm-hmm. for acetates and resins, usually there's a couple of them. For the brass ones, there's only going to be one. For the patterns, there's only going to be, the you know, the two, but there are different steps of the pattern process. So certain cars, you have to get while you can, and other ones, you can maybe wait for the next one and just hope it shows up. But that's, you know, like I said, the resin ones, I just, you know, started getting them when I could. And this is a paint master. This one basically looks exactly as production. And it's basically, I don't know if that's glued or soldered, but the base. And this one was, I believe, from the Bruce Schultz collection. And he had a bunch of the paint masters of that. And that was that was one of the ones that I just always thought was really cool when I got it. So, but that's why I do the Phantom Corsairs. It's a side tangent. Even a guy like myself gets bored with what they're doing. So you go on little side quests. And that was one of them. And the production of Phantom Corsairs, you know, they're cheap. They're a dollar. Yeah, they're. You know, so you can knock all those out in the weekend on eBay if you get bored. And then what do you, you know, now, okay, I had this side quest and it's done. So then you start looking for prototypes. See, and but that's the thing about doing it, doing all of this through eBay. It takes the fun out of it. The fun for me is going to the show and trying to hunt for it and look for it and find it. Because that's part of why I like still going to the store is going to the peg and seeing it on there yeah. now. With the way things are currently, it, right. it sucks. But no, I like I said, I still do the toy shows. I just, you know, I go in not really expecting to find like a, a cord that I don't have or an auburn that I don't have because there's just not that many of them, but I still enjoy them. And as you guys know, when I was living in Oklahoma, I came up to a couple of shows up here in Nebraska. Yeah. And I've been to them, you mm-hmm. know, I drove to Ohio for a trade day there in May. And, you know, I used to have Redline trade days at my house in Ohio when I was in college. You know, I have 40 people show up in my parents' basement and nothing but red lines. <laughs> But I've been into it for a little while, and I got it pretty bad. I was going to say, you were at our very, very first show. Yeah. I remember mm-hmm. that. And I went to the first other, the whatever, the, the super yeah. convention that you guys yeah. did last year. Uh, yeah, so, Aaron's convention up in Sioux City. So I've done a couple of them, and I'll hopefully be able to go to more now that I'm a little bit closer. So Yes, we are very happy that you were back. What else do you want to see next, man? There's <laughs> so much stuff. <laughs> Well, Do you have any here, of the classic? I don't uh, see that 100% piece. What's that? I said, "Do you have any of the classic catalog caddy stuff with you?" I don't. I've only got one or two of those. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Remember, man, I, Auburn Ford Duesenberg. I got a stick. If if I, I I can't hardly afford the ones I got, so if I branch out, you know, now I want prototypes of it and everything that else. It gets expensive. So this is. So far, the closest I've come to a pre-production, this is the classic body set that has a Bugatti and a Duesenberg 100%. And this is another one from Larry Wood Collection. And it's got a production a PP sample, which is production pilot. And that's as close as I've been able to get. There's a couple of the 100% prototypes of the Duesenberg out there, but they're in the hands of 100% collectors. And I have not been able to persuade them to send one my way yet. But this is basically the last step before they hit the shelves. Yeah. You've been invited to come to Diecast Meets first show in Fremont. <laughs> I'm trying, guys. I just recently got up in the area and I'm trying to work through a bunch of other stuff and moving. And do you have any awesome red lines? Oh man. If it's a classic cord, <laughs> I got it, guy. I don't, who was that? Steven. Was that great? It's Steven again. So there's maybe what twenty Five sips of cords known to exist, and I've got five of them at the house, so that's pretty good. Yeah, you're pretty good odds. You're you're in the twenty percent range. So, and I, you know, like my friend Ted that has a super fine, he also does the sips of stuff, so he's got four of them, and I've got a friend Gabriel that's got three of them. So, if, you know, if all of the classic cord red lines, me and two buddies own over half of them. That's pretty good odds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just got to come back down to Nebraska where they can have their forever home. That's right. So <laughs> I'm working on it, but you know, I, I kind of put the the regular classic cords aside when the prototype started coming up because I figured I could always get another, you know, I do have a pink cord, but it's not perfect. It's maybe an eight, five or a nine condition. Mm-hmm. But since the prototypes were hitting, I kind of put that aside on trying to upgrade and figure one of those will pop up eventually. I need to grab the prototypes while I can. Yeah. I would agree with you on that because they're just so difficult to get. I mean, I was surprised I was even able to get that, the paint sample mm-hmm. MR2 that I got and, and you know, I'm quite happy that I have that. I mean, what, what any other questions? Um, we've got some more cars here. Oh, yeah, I've, I've you know, I've, I've shown maybe like a half of what I brought, but you know, they're Auburn's mm-hmm. and doozies. 
I guess another cool, interesting one is these are both from Larry Wood Collection. Back in the 70s, they would do the toy fairs, and I guess they still do, but they would try to make them look better and more cool. So this is actually a toy fair car. This is the Auburn. There we go. And it's a different color paint. The fenders are actually painted. They're not molded like the normal ones. They tried to dress up the hubs with the orange paint and look cool. But I thought that one was super cool. It's not really a prototype, but it's definitely a unique piece, and it's a screw base. Nice. And I have a doozy, and this one, my I have a friend, John, and this is one of his favorite cars that I own. I think it's cool, but I don't think it's as cool as he thinks it is. But this is a doozy toy fair car, and it's kind of the same thing. It got a, a color scheme that was never produced. You know, they dressed up the hubs, and actually what he likes about it is on the other side, yeah. they added some painted or taped on white walls. One of them's oh. been lost in translation and over the years, but, you know, the back... I guess that's the front and the spare still have the white wall on it. And nice. if it's not going to show, and I can show Kent here, there's a pinstripe on there that is actually a material. It's like a hair. Yeah. You can see it on see there. It. Yeah, you wouldn't pick it up yeah. on the camera. But it's another, they put a lot of detail trying to get a, a, a pinstripe along well, that. Edge. And then that, you know, just as a comparison, you know, you have that toy fair car right there. And then I've got this one here. I mean, it's not a great. Yeah, casting per se, but it, it's a unique way of how they've changed how much they put into these yeah. cars. So, so these are fair. These are basically production pieces, just very, very, very limited run. And the older ones were one or two, and they yeah, just you know they're hand painted. Show. Yeah, just mm -hmm. to try to get more attention to them. So I ended up with both of those, and then for the most part, after that, you end up getting into different variations of castings instead of the production side of it. So, you know, like when they were doing in the 80s, when they were trying different wheels, you had the gold hot ones. So you got a doozy with the gold hot ones, and that came from another employee collection, which is, I think, is just a super cool kind of oddball. There's only, as far as I know, one of those. And that same collection had a slew of cars that were similar with the gold hot ones, and they were just seeing what they looked like on all this stuff. So you got that, and then this one, you won't be able to tell it, but this is a actually a hand-painted... The original one. And I think this one is a catalog car also being a hand painted one. And it looks so close to the original, but if you actually take it apart and again, it won't translate into the video, but the fenders are not molded green. Like the normal ones are. These are actually painted green fenders. There's actually originally an orange juicy with brown fenders. And I actually defaced it a little bit to prove it. You know, I took it apart when I got it to see if that's what it really was. Mm -hmm. And you see they're painted over. Oh, yeah, it was so brown. We'll see. I don't know if that'll show. You can see that it was green. It was the brown fenders that were painted green. Yeah, you can see it. So, so anyways, that's another cool one. That came, I believe it originated from the Strauss collection. You know, that one took a little while to get to me, but it's here. I guess that's what's important. You know, speaking of, uh, of prototypes that are stuff. a little... So a lot of the ones... Uh, I was going to say, just speaking of uh, painted wheels, ever seen a yeah, neon exactly, orange yeah. one with neon orange interior, glass is yellow, but yeah, that's a, that's a hand painted one from uh, the Lewis Montedeca collection. So, so here's a tip on the collection stuff and hand painted things on the same token is this the American Classic said it had a 35 Caddy, a Doozy, and an Auburn. All three of these are hand-painted, and they are all slightly different. Yeah, and if you actually happen. notice, the bottom one is in a baggie. Now, there you go. I'll tell you guys this one. If you're looking for stuff like this and you get the guys that have the big employee collections, look at everything they sell because they still miss stuff. So this is one that they did not sell as a prototype, but it is a hand-painted prototype. And it, just, it didn't come with a certificate, but you know, and actually, yeah. It's got some Velcro on it, which means it was probably used as a catalog shoot car. Yep. But aside from that, it is definitely a hand painted car that matches the other two. And that, ironically, I bought one of those from those guys. So they knew at least one was a hand painted one, but they missed the other. So you can still get deals on prototypes if you really, really scour those kind of you gotta options. Know. Oh, yeah. You got to look. But I found, you know, I've, I managed to acquire a couple of them. So, I mean, it still happens. And then, like, these guys, the American – or – the service merchandise set. Yes. The Chrome Wonder, one of 5,000 each set, right? So then, obviously, there was an Auburn and a Doozy in there. So, naturally, I had to, you know, 
So there's the service merchandise set, Auburn. And originally they were not going to have chrome fenders. They're going to have red fenders. <laughs> and, you know, if one's good, then obviously two is better. So I got a pair of those guys. Nice. And then same with the doozy. I bought the doozy, one of them from a friend in California several years ago. at something like 2 a.m. in the morning. And you can see that the roof was painted to make it black, which it's got wear, but it's cool because it shows that. But again, where one is good, two is better. <laughs> so this one actually came from the, I think it was a Louis collection also, but this one is in like perfect condition, but yeah. two different sources, but same type of prototype. And it shows that there are multiples of them out there. Very cool. Nice. What else, man? Well, what else you got? I can honestly say I found <laughs> one car and I haven't really looked that hard yet. There's only one car. Okay. Well, I found it. There's something else. You'll find it eventually, but there's one, there's only one car. Okay. I've warped my fragile little mind to quote Cartman. Um, let's see. I don't see anything on the buttons side of the house. While he's looking, I'll keep hammering. This is the 36 cord. I didn't really focus on the 36 cord because I want to do the Auburns and uh, classic cords. So I didn't do the 36 cord and a doozy until later. But this is a multi piece resin of it. And this one is hollow. When it comes apart, it is actually screwed together. And I have taken it apart, but it kind of scares me. Mm -hmm. because it's you know threaded into resin but i mean this is basically exactly like the production one how it assembles and everything else which i think is very cool and then throughout the time when they were selling the employee collections i was able to get several resins of the 36 cord are you making fun of me man no i'm just i was laughing i was laughing and at kent just back there wandering around <laughs> so to go down the 36 cord resins and i, I think this is cool too so like this one is matt maroon i guess no wheels or anything and it's definitely not quite like production you know the body is very close but the the paint is not there and then you know you get to maybe a little bit further along the process and it's now got gloss they've added wheels to it but this is again a resin piece a solid resin wow and then now this one doesn't have wheels but they painted the windows silver to try to get again just different steps along the way to try to get it and again that's another resin of 36 cord and then Man, I believe this cool. one is a catalog car because it has the wheels and it is gloss and it is full painted bumpers and everything. Yeah. Um, I, so that's I four resins I, of the 36 cord. Yeah. I've got a lot of the, of the, of, of, I've got a lot of old books and, and magazines and posters and stuff like that. And you'd be surprised on how many times that there is resin prototypes or hand painted cars in those books. Oh. And most people don't even know that. So. And the fun part about that, too, is when one of the resins shows up, you know exactly what it is when you see it or another prototype. So, like, in 95 and 96, they had the – or, yeah, 95, they had the flip book that they did at store shelves, and that's mm -hmm. loaded with prototypes. And the, the Auburn – and the 96 one, the Auburn has not shown up yet, but the Auburn in there is a prototype. It's not a resin one. But if it ever shows up, I'll know exactly what it is. I yeah. love the paperwork side of it. I found the other piece. He was supposed to wait till I was gone, but, you know – well, a challenge was laid down. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so that's the 95. So I don't remember. No, this is, from, this, this, this is the 96 here. From production. Oh, it is? Yeah, this is the 96 here. Okay. So go to, if you go to the Auburn, it's going to be almost like dark gray or black instead of gold, if I remember correctly. I'm trying to remember Auburn, where it is. So as he's looking for that, um, there it is. Or no, yeah, the Auburn. What do you think of? Oh, that blend. Yeah, so you can see how much different that looks from production. And unfortunately, several years ago, most of the '96 Treasure Hunt prototype catalog car showed up on eBay, but the guy didn't have the Auburn, so it's still hopefully out there somewhere. Or not ruined. Yeah, let's hope for not ruined. So you know, what are your thoughts on you know, obviously the Duesenberg. And the 852 have made it to the the treasure hunt world. What do you think about that? Do you think that was a good idea to include them, to not include them? I like them. Well, I, I, I obviously... Well, but so right. I guess what I mean by that is they did, they did them justice. You know, I like the cars because they are classic. And they didn't make them look real goofy and with crazy tampos or anything. Okay. So, honestly, like the Phantom Corsairs, I have all the Phantom Corsairs, but I only display the ones that don't have tampos because I really think that messes up the mojo of my display to have, like, the ones with pirates on the side of it and all this other stuff. 
Yeah, so I don't display those. I've got them, but it's just, to me, it's not the same. So, but I'm glad when they did them, that they did them justice and made them look nice. Oh, yeah. See, I can't tell any difference on that from a production one. No, you can't. So, but I don't know. That may be a prototype. But when you go to the Cadillac, that one's way different because the Cadillac is more of a green. This is more of a brown almost. It's really not coming through on this card, though. Where's the rolls in that thing? Um, See if it looks different or not. Of course, I already passed it. Did it. Oh, that's the bug. Rolls Royce uh, Phantom 2, I think it's called. Yeah, right there. Um, no, it looks pretty pretty close to the production. You mean like this? Yeah, that one. It, well, hey, I mean, we can... I'm not an expert on those, so I'm not really sure. And you do, you know, a lot of the prototypes now, they do Barbie interior to go back to that. So this is a doozy of the, you know, 2000s. Oh, there you go. <laughs> nice Barbie I can interior. do that. <laughs> now, when you... When you say Barbie interior, what do you mean by that? So the fenders on these are like that caramel tan color. It's the, supposedly is the same color and type of plastic that they use on the Barbie dolls. So they just generally call it Barbie interior. Now, now they do this blue Barbie. We don't under, I don't quite understand that one. But originally, they were very close to the Barbie tone. And it's just a different plastic they never really used on Hot Wheels per se. But they did use it in prototype where they didn't need the color. Okay. I actually like that. So this is another example that there's there's at least five of these doozies with Barbie interior out there. So that's another one of those that if you miss the first one, you know, another one or two might show up later. You never know, but it's not necessarily the end of the world if you don't get the first one. I've got the yeah. last wheeled one, but it has a black interior. Correct. On. Yep. And that's, this is basically the, pro, the production prototype for that. Gotcha. So you got little differences. They've already got all their the mechanics of it worked out, the bases and everything yeah. joined together. And now it's just color schemes. Gotcha. So... And I, and Ken, just a heads up, a real quick, uh, just a heads up, I'm down to a phone, so <laughs> the backup, the comments are gone from oh. my end, so you're in charge of the comments now. Well, I've got them from, I got them from here, so I think we're okay. able to roll. All right. I mean, we, haven't had a, we haven't had a comment in a while. I think everybody's well, just kind of in awe. Yeah, I think everybody's just enjoying the show. So, Mike, here's another thought that I had for you. Um, as Mattel has progressed throughout time, they've moved away from metal, metal, you know, metal car, metal base, and more into the metal car plastic base. Would you think that that would do, like, the core, the do all the classic cars, would that do them justice, or do you think they should be all metal, metal? I mean, obviously, I would prefer metal, metal, but thankfully, none of the doozies ever got made with a metal or a plastic base, and none of the Auburns ever got made with a plastic base, and none of the classic cords ever got made with a plastic base. But the 36 cord was, and I, I would have obviously preferred it to be a metal base, but I understand that, you know, the times are different now. Right. So uh, if, if they did another one, it would probably be a plastic base if I had to take a guess. But I mean, then again, the Phantom Corsair, as far as I know. Yeah, it was a. Uh... It was metal. There's a prototype yeah. of it out there with a plastic base act. So <clears throat> here's my another question is car culture is the the top of the line uh, premium series out there. All right. Okay. To me, the Accord, the Auburn, the Duesenberg, the classic Caddy, um, and the 37 Bugatti would be a great classic set. Okay. So what, if you, would I name four or did I name five castings there? I think I named five. five. If, if there's okay. one that you could add or take away, what would it be? So as much as I like the old cars, I don't do the Caddies and the Bugattis and right. the Rolls Royce and all that. So, I mean, I'm a perfect set would be an Auburn Accord, a Doozy, and a Phantom Corsair, and I would call it quits, and that would be fine with me. Ironically, one of the best, to me, the best sets out there is the FAO Schwartz one, in it because it does have an Auburn, it has a Doozy, and it has a Phantom Corsair and a 36 Accord. And it's like, you know, I could buy that set and get, what, four cars out of it. 
and, and have a couple extras floating around that, you know, kind of whatever, but they're all amazing looking cars. So now that you're going to mention that, are you ready for some more trivia? Yes. Let's do all it. right. So this is a treasure hunt of the, the cord treasure hunt. And if you look at the posters, this is the same one that's in there and it has the, it's gray instead of silver and it's stickers instead of tampos. And there's actually, they're slightly different in production. But my theory on this is that this is the FAO Schwartz one with stickers applied to make the prototype of it because okay. the paint matches that. the same as the FAO. So sometimes they just reused and just kind of slapped something else on it and called it different because the interior is also the same as the FAO. Okay. So my question now is, okay. why did they use, or and, and you may not know because it's kind of getting out of the, your time period, so to speak. Okay. Why on the treasure hunt was there white walls and non-white walls? Okay, so if you go to further help with my theory here, to not directly answer your question, we'll get there, yeah. is the <laughs> early core treasure hunt were white walls and they had gray fenders. And I still believe that they were leftover fenders from the FAO Schwartz series. They probably didn't sell as good or something, so they had leftover parts. So then the early ones were white walls with gray fenders, and then they made made them all silver so they were full silver cars and then the later ones were black walls and i think that was just the availability of parts is generally what it is okay and that and that makes sense i don't have a you know i don't have for certain that and none of the you know this is just one of those when you start getting a bunch of cars and seeing differences and similarities between them that you know i can't say for sure that this is fao turned into a prototype but it makes sense I mean, yeah, there's some plausibility. And it follows the timeline and everything else of the car. I mean, the interior, the paint, and everything is the same as the FAO Schwartz. It just doesn't have the tampos on it. So it's not a super exciting prototype, but it is cool. If you do look at the posters, it matches it. It has Goodyear tires on it. Right. And has the same decals right. and everything else. And you can definitely tell it's the same car. That's, I mean, that's cool in a way because yeah. it, it's reusing what they had available to do it. Now, what's this green one? green cord here okay so this is another fun one and you probably had no idea about this one when you go to the conventions they have the charity auctions man if y'all have not gone to a convention you have to go to a group like the la convention or the nationals at some point just to experience it and i have gone with like no money in my pocket and it's been totally worth it but it's definitely worth going anyways charity <laughs> auction one year they had buckets of cars from the larry wood cage and you okay. can go through and you can preview and you just kind of look and they just have a tub of cars oh, okay. and okay. you have to, you know, am I going to bid on that? Bay, you know, based off of looking at it from five feet away and in there was this cord and I spotted it that it had a gray base instead of a chrome base and all the production ones have a chrome base. And I said, that's kind of weird. And I, and I didn't, you know, you couldn't see it that well. You, all you could see is maybe like that. And you just have to know mm -hmm. what, you, what you're buying and what you're looking at and just best. So I bid and bid and bid. And up winning it, and there was this in there, which I fully on believe is a prototype with the markings in the it is in the gray base. I but it is. also in there were nine other cores that were chrome bases, but they all had one through nine etched on them, like they were test pieces for something. So that must have been 2018, you know, <laughs> Dallas or LA, and maybe into Chicago, because I remember sitting with Ken Sleeth um, either in LA. Well, maybe not in L.A., but either – no, Chicago. It had to be Chicago because we didn't go to the charity auction in 18. and It wasn't Chicago, so it was either Dallas or L.A. the following okay. year. Well, I, I can't remember, but we would have been sitting together. Well, we went to the, we went to the charity in, in L.A. for a few minutes. I do remember okay. going to and L.A. for a few I'm minutes. Going. But Ken wasn't there in L.A. <clears throat> So then it would have had to have been down. Well, they've done that for a few conventions. So it wasn't just one where they had the Larry Wood cage yeah. colors. They've done it for several. And then back to the first edition, this is another one that I had. And I didn't realize this one for a long time, that this is a first edition with a gray base. And I thought it was pretty interesting, but I didn't really know a whole lot about it. But when I got my drawers of cars that I mentioned before and had, you know, hundreds of cars lined up, I had this one sitting in it. And then and later, and I don't, it's not going to come through, but it actually has a Barbie interior too instead of the regular interior. And mm -hmm. I didn't notice it until they were all lined up and that one stood out. So the gray base with Barbie interior further proves that it's a prototype, which I thought was super cool. Nice. And that also helps with the gray base on the other one, kind of proving that it's a prototype. Gotcha. Because I have the green one. Yeah. 
but it's kind of metal based on it, obviously. So what else do you got in here? I see some uh, Zamac or like, um, well, you got, well, let's finish up with the cords because you got them. All right, right. So I got two more. This is another one that came from Mr. Lord Wiggins, as you guys probably call him. <laughs> and this, he had that big board of paint samples and this is a cord body that came from it. And he liked to tease me about this one, but it is, it looks the same on camera, I'm sure, but it is actually quite a bit different than the production one. Actually here, I'll see if this will show. I just like how he casually puts them together. You can see one is metallic and one is not. Hopefully, there's yeah. a difference with the one. Yeah, on top the, bo the, the bottom one it. has more of a root, has a more of a darker maroon color to it. Almost has a black to it. Correct, yeah. and, and it's metal flake. And that the bottom one is it's plated. It's, you know, it's got a a chrome base, but it also is unspun with a Barbie tan interior. And this one also came from an employee that went to a show, kind of like you know, yeah how they come to some of the local shows and people get them to come. He brought some stuff as a giveaway and that was one of them and eventually found my way from a friend. He got it from the employee there and I got it from him at probably LA. I think it was. I actually like the Barbie interior on that. It, yeah, it looks, red. yeah, it looks way. So the original ones had like purple. I think it was mm. on the, on the first edition. Okay. So what about these two up front here? These look like they're Frankenstein. Cars. All right. This is another side tangent. That sometimes even the best of us get sidetracked and these are what Ozenberg. So I just, you know, it's a cruise casting, and I kind of convinced myself because I was bored that it's kind of sort of halfway based off of a Duesenberg, maybe, maybe. I don't know. So I ended up with a couple prototypes of that for somehow. I, let's see, this one, they're, let's see, they're, they're both blank base. No, it's not. Sorry. This one is Zamac, which is black fenders. And the if you know the Ozenberg, they only made the one release of it, and it was orange with, like, brown fenders and lace wheels, I believe. Mm -hmm. So this one's got some markings on i don't know if it'll show on there but they're very faint markings on it on the can, cowl i believe yeah, yeah you can see yeah you can see the blue they almost look like numbers okay and then the next one i ended up with was uh this one has you know five spoke in but it's a non-production color and it's a blank face one which half the reason when i talked myself into these is because at the time maybe i didn't have a blank base of one of the castings i collected and i just wanted a version of a blank base so, you know, uh, it's close enough and I'll get one. So it's kind of similar. I'll eventually end up with a grid car of something. It won't be a casting I collect, but I just want one for the archive. Yeah. Gotcha. And that makes sense. You, those grid cars are just They're so, so cool. cool. Okay. So um, what else we got over there? Now, what about these two, these treasure, two treasure hunts and the other carded car, other core? So we're over here talking to So, okay. So this one is a production pilot slash production sample and mmsb was the uh, basically the the plant i guess you want to call it in overseas we'll call it asia i'm not exactly sure where it was but this is basically a final production of the doozy before they went out and they, they'll have the sticker on it with a little bit of marking on the date and which part of this process it is so they'll have hey. MP, fep pp or other and then the bottom of it is like basically initials of who ordered it. And this is basically production, but again, kind of just a unique piece along the product, the process. So basically these are cars that are saying we're giving the final approval. Correct. This is a final sign off and let's go we'll hit the go button and start mass producing these things. So this is kind of where the 271 comes in. It's kind of where they, they tested it out and then they said, well, you know what? We want to go to redo the card art. Pretty much. There we go. Trying to open protective packs over here. And this is a another production pilot of the Auburn. And that's one that, again, a friend he got and he, you know, found the Auburn its way to me. But pretty much it looks like production, but the sticker just makes it cool. as just oh, another nice. step along the process. So not all the FEPs are on cards. Sometimes you do have them on... <clears throat> You know the little hang tags, and I'm sure you probably got a couple. My FEPs were all completely loose, but they were, again, you know, way before they started keeping track and, and cataloging them the way they do now. So this one, I don't know if any of you guys are old school Redline Club members, but if you remember the guy X Oki on Redline Club, Loafwood. So he was he was one of the original mods on there, and this was one of the cars that he had way back in the day. It's FEP of the number 793 Auburn, and he had posted it, and I always thought it was awesome, and I saved a picture of it, and there's a long story to it, but it eventually found its way to me via a friend, that a mutual friend, and I didn't know he knew, 
Bernie and Bernie, New you year. know, and anyways, I had saved the picture on my phone. And when I went in to go buy it from Bernie, I showed him the picture I had saved like 15 years ago. And he, he gave <laughs> me the car. He says, anybody that saves a picture of a car for 15 years, <laughs> you've you know, it. yeah, you've earned it. So he, he didn't <laughs> let me pay for it, but I thought it was super cool that, it, you know, I had it. And it was his picture originally back when he posted on HWC, probably like 2003 or something like that. Uh, it said on the back of their 1999 revamped. Yeah. So, yeah, that's another. And he got this one at a charity auction from Mattel. You know, nice. but anyways, when I when I showed up and at the time I had maybe 10 prototypes of the Auburn doozy stuff and he was like amazed at the time. So he, he forked it over. And then so this one doesn't have a tag. And if you have to really know this is a FEP of the pinstripe power Auburn and most FEPs are the same, but this one actually has like a, a super shiny chrome base on it. The normal ones don't have that. It's kind of odd, but it's another little step that this one actually had a very slight difference to it. And I thought it was neat. And that one came from another employee collection. So, and then one of my favorite ones that I always wanted out of Larry Woods, even though it's not super exciting is you basically got bookends of the production process for the Auburn its entire life. If oh, you start yeah. with the original approval sample, that was the one I showed originally. And then basically the FEP for the final run. So, I mean, that's basically the very last one. And I, I consider those bookends for the entire run of the Auburn. And mm -hmm. that was one of the last, the FEP was one of the last ones I got from Larry Wood collection. And I was kind of happy to, you know, be able to put them together. Brent, you, you've added another one to your list. Well, yeah, but it doesn't mean I'm going to find them. <laughs> I, I only got to have... ask, man. Well, I mean, I have the final run of the Mercedes. I just don't have the, I don't have FAPs, you know, or, you know, I mean, I have, yeah, I mean, I have the final run of the Mercedes. But you got to step your game up, man. I don't have the connection. So maybe me and you need to talk a little bit. <laughs> You know, you get the connections by talking to people. They're still people, and they still like talking, and it's not always about I, business. I understand that, but I just need to know who to talk to. <laughs> because, I mean... There's I another FEP that's a different doozy, but it's another tag one. So I thought that one was another cool one, and I guess I got one more because, you know, Adam goes on side tangents, and this is the FEP of the Ozenberg. That's cool. And that's another one from Larry Wood collection. It was just bought out of sheer boredom since I had the other two protos. And, you know, why not? What's another one? And friend yeah. Tim, who now is finished and selling the Larry Wood stuff, he brought it to me at one of the shows. I'm, I don't remember which. Yeah, but I was going to say. I don't know if you can see this, Adam. I bought a bunch of stuff to make. Hey, that's Adam, can you, can you see this one? Yeah. yeah. It has red interior, blue base, yellow wheels. Well, actually, blue trim. The base is actually chrome. I'm going to hate on you here for a minute. I'm so glad the Auburn or Doozy was never a California custom car. <laughs> oh, my God. This thing is hideous. I hate this thing, but I had to have it. So, <laughs> But you love it at the same time. Yes. Oh, yeah, I do. I get it. I do. But this, right, this one, so come on. I, this, this one was sharp, though. I and just, this one, I do not completely understand the appeal of California customs. That was not my era. And again, growing up next to a guy that had an Auburn, maybe yeah. that skewed me a bit. Maybe it was my era, and I just didn't really appreciate them. But I know they were super popular. Just not my thing. I hear you. I, I hear you. The real writers. So, I mean, they they look paint wise. They look amazing. Some of them look amazing. <laughs> Otherwise, no. All right, so. Man, can you grab my case over there real quick, the, the Jammers case? So since he mentioned Real Riders, I'm going to show you this little thing real quick. And this is just <laughs> pure insanity. And that back in Redline's online day, Bruce Pascal sent me a message that he got a bunch of Auburns in. And they were Auburn paint sample bodies. And I don't know if you can see this, but that's just a bag of unspun paint samples. <laughs> okay? And then... It's got a bag of bodies. This is the second bag of unspun paint samples. I think I've got like 60 or 70 of these paint samples. Good Lord. But they came with, a couple of them had bases. And when you get extras like that, I'll give you a chair back. Oh, no, 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 you're fine right When here. you get a couple extras like that, you get to make some fantasy pieces. 
So I've gotten some real riders and that's an unspun paint sample body with a pure unspun raw base, but I just slap real riders on it just to see what one would look like. I'm actually digging that. So yeah, like I was that, that thing yeah, looks you know, pretty sweet actually. Tubs, and when you got just parts like this just laying around just for your own benefit, now you got the you gotta have the gray hub. But again, right. that's a paint sample unspun. <laughs> they should have, have done that. I have a sickness, guys. No, that's you that's freaking it. cool. I like that. And that's the only really cool. Is more doozies. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Anyways, I don't I don't remember the final count on the paint samples, but there was there's roughly seventy of those yellow enamel paint samples, and they're all slightly different sprays and thickness and color shades, but and they're, they're all, all at, yellow. And they're all at Adam's house. That's right. Every last one of them that I've been able to acquire. So that right. is impressive. Um, anybody else got any other questions? Brent, you got any questions? Hopefully, I didn't bore you guys, Steph. I know I have an insane passion for this stuff, but no, I'm I just like showing it. Every I'm just now sitting and over here, just in awe. It's like you know, it's, I mean, even though they're they're just playing around pieces, those the the white hub and the gray hub, those things look amazing. Like they should have made those. <laughs> I agree. Those, those the white really looks cool. That's nuts. It makes you wish you could hop in the DeLorean and go like, Larry, what are you thinking? Please or make that. Please do, oh, yes. Yeah. That's nuts. <laughs> no, I'm just... Well, you know, it's great. You know what? <laughs> we even have a lot to learn. And like Adam yeah. said, the only way you're going to learn is by asking questions and talking to people. Well, that yeah. requiring cars that you know, when you get them, you get to investigate them. Not to go all the way back to the beginning, but a little bit of trivia on that brass classic cord that I recently acquired. You know, they hadn't gotten everything made and all the molds and everything, but I actually took this car apart, much to the chagrin of some of my friends, and the interior of it is actually from a classic Vicky that they modified to fit. Ah, that's awesome. So I, t I took it apart, took pictures of the interior. I'm like, man, that's weird, but that doesn't look like a cord interior. And I sent it to a friend of mine. He goes, that's a Vicky interior. Now, how on earth he could spot a Vicky interior from just a quick picture is beyond me. But, you know, you, they had casting numbers on it, and you check it, and sure enough, yeah. it was a Vicky interior. And a lot of the brass cars had stuff like that, that they were not necessarily specific to that car. They were modified to make them just good enough for the photo shoots. Right. I, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. It really would. Because you don't need them to be perfect. You're no. not really going to see that. You just want to sit yeah. them in there. Yeah. So, anyways, I thought well, when I took that apart, I discovered that little tidbit of information. Okay, yeah, that's, well, that's really cool. Come to that part of the show, and um, well, I have a card here, and they don't roll very well on the card, dude. I know, but I think we might want to move these two. So, in case, yeah, yeah. he tends to get I, wild I, I, and no. like throw things, and just just do it easy, man. Just, yeah, just 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 take your time. You don't have to get all crazy and throw and stuff and just just take your time. All right. For those of you are of you that are new to the show or never really watched it before, and even to you old veterans, what we like to do is we like to open a car at the end of the show. And for tonight, um, Adam brought me this to open. So I'm gonna <laughs> open this. This is a Rolls Royce Phantom 2, number eight of twelve treasure hunt series. Limited to only 10,000, and so that tells me it's a 95. Heck yeah, man. There we go. We're not throwing anything tonight. No, you have, you've got way and too many things there. around there. there Very nice. Looks Gorgeous. so much better, doesn't it? Gorgeous color. Uh, similar to the cord color, isn't it? Pretty close, yeah. With your Hot Wheels logo there. Very nice. Very close. I like this red. I All like right. wheels. <laughs> I'm going to do your something turn. I thought I wouldn't do either, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, it does not have a number on the back of it, but it is from 2006, the sixth annual Atlanta Nationals. I'm going to open a pink party car. But I'm going to do it a little bit nicer than normal. I'm actually going to remove. Oh, come on, man. No. Oh, well, we might. Nope. All right. Screw it. Oh, God. There you go. All right. We, we just did that. Oh, God. And we are opening the classic cord in honor of Mr. Like Adam. 
and and I did just tear it off. So, but there we go. Head up. Cannot right. believe it. I, I like I it. Just, well done. <laughs> and oh, look. oh, there we go. Beautiful. There. I like it with the top down. Yeah, those yeah. are kind of expensive, man. Yeah. All the pink cars are. <laughs> Like I said, I, I can't believe I just did that, but you know, hey, it rolls a lot better out of the bag. <laughs> it does, and the and the bag in in my defense, the bag was really really hammered. So, but now it's free and it's happy, and it'll look good in the case. Looks good, man. Thanks, sir. All right, guys, that's our show for this week. Uh, next week, we will have Brian Hetrick on. We're, we promised we're gonna, we're gonna, that we we're, would fix round two it. you guys. And I think maybe we're next gonna, week, I, I might have to go to a different location. So, All right. So once again, thank you to Mr. Adam. Thank Mr. you, Adam. Brent, this is myself. We're saying good night. Y'all have a good Good night and stay cold or warm or whatever you're trying stay to do. Stay warm. Stay warm. Thanks for hanging out, guys. All right. Good night. Good night.